Sup, you beautiful bastards. Hope you've had a fantastic Tuesday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. And a quick thing before we get started, friendly reminder that you only have six days left if you want to get the brand new One Day Will All Be Skeletons hoodie or shirt. But let's just say this is coffee mug. And of course, our Adams Don't Be Stupid Stupid Masks. All available on shopdefranco.com for a limited time. But with that said, welcome to the Philip DeFranco Show. Buckle up, hit that like button, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing that we're gonna talk about today is a story and news that I'm kind of just gonna use as a way to poll you. Today, we saw CNBC tweet out an article writing, Biden defines $400,000 a year as, quote, wealthy. In big cities, it only makes you upper middle class. With one of their key points being, according to a financial planning analysis, families making $400,000 a year aren't exactly living large, especially in major cities, which I would personally say, bullshit. As someone who grew up not having money and now finding myself in the privileged position of being kind of top one, top 2% in America, yes, $400,000 a year makes you wealthy. As even noted in the article, by national measures, those making $400,000 belong to a rarefied group. Keyword being rarefied, right? Top of the pyramid. They represent the top 1.8% of taxpayers, earning about 25% of the nation's income. And so I guess I just find it absolutely ludicrous that you could be in the top 2% of earners and be like, eh, I'm not wealthy though. What, because you decided to live somewhere incredibly expensive? Because you, an adult person who's responsible for their own actions, made the choice of I'm gonna live here rather than maybe live somewhere cheaper. And yes, it'll do this to my transportation time, but I don't know, man. If you can't figure it out on $400,000 a year, I, I don't. Oof. Friend, you are living in Disneyland. I hope the real world never catches up with you. Also, so you understand why this article is even being done, Biden wants to tax wealthy people more with a marginal tax increase, meaning that the only taxpayers that would see tax increases are people making an income of over $400,000. But also, even the people making between $400,000 to $700,000, I think it's like a 1% increase. But the bulk of the revenue brought in from this marginal tax increase expected from people making more than a million dollars a year. But yeah, that's why this article is even being done. But I, I guess the question I have, well, one, do you agree with me? It is fine if you disagree, just let me know why. But also, if you agree that $400,000 is wealthy, right? $400,000 a year. What yearly amount of money brought in do you believe that means that person hits wealthy? Let me know what you think there and why. I I'm really fascinated here. And then let's talk about Rihanna being in the news because she was getting hit with an absolute ton of backlash. This over her second Savage Fenty show, which hit Amazon Prime on Friday, which I think for a lot of people, you hear Rihanna getting backlash for her show. Why? Right? I mean, normally she's just being praised for her line and her shows for features featuring models of different races and sizes. But the reason Rihanna here was hit with this wave of criticism was because she used an Islamic hadith in her lingerie show. And for those unfamiliar, hadith is a collection of traditional Muslim phrases from the Prophet Muhammad used as guidance for those of the Islamic faith. And so essentially what happened here is during the show, a song titled Doom was played, which was created by London-based producer Cuckoo Chloe. That song samples hadith narration about the end of times and judgment day mixed into a house beat. And so when viewers recognized this, it prompted reactions like, Rihanna is messed up for using a song with a hadith in it to play it her lingerie show? What is up with artists using Islam as an aesthetic? Have some respect. And as a Muslim, no words can describe how disappointed I am with Rihanna for letting her models dance to Hadith. Hadith are the sacred words of our prophet. You can't just use it for your lingerie show. Disgusting and extremely disrespectful. Also, uh, apparently after some digging, many pointed out that this song was actually used in the past during Rihanna's 2017 Fenty Puma show. Right, and so you had people pointing to that moment, also noting that people in the past had an issue with this. So maybe that shows that Rihanna does not care. Also here, we eventually saw the song produced write an apology online, saying, I want to deeply apologize for the offense caused by the vocal sample used in my song, Doom. The song was created using samples from Baile Funk tracks I found online. At the time, I was not aware that these samples used text from an Islamic Hadith. I take full responsibility for the fact I did not research these words properly and want to thank those of you who have taken the time to explain this to me. And also noting, we have been in the process of having the song urgently removed from all streaming platforms. And as far as Rihanna, we actually saw her come forward this morning with an apology of her own, saying, I'd like to thank the Muslim community for pointing out a huge oversight that was unintentionally offensive in our Savage Fenty show. I would more importantly like to apologize to you for this honest yet careless mistake. We understand that we have hurt many of our Muslim brothers and sisters, and I'm incredibly disheartened by this. I do not play with any kind of disrespect toward God or any religion, and therefore, the use of this song in our project was completely irresponsible. But yeah, that's essentially the story as it is now, and ultimately, it ends up being one of those stories of now it's just in the court of public opinion. Right, well, the people that were angry about this, or even the people that were kind of just looking in, they see that as, yeah, it was an innocent mistake, she's owning up to it, it's 
acceptable? Or no, do you still have an issue with this? Is it still using a religion, a culture as an aesthetic? But yeah, if you have any thoughts on this one, I'd love to hear from you in those comments down below. But from that, I wanna share some stuff I love today and today in awesome brought to you by Movement. As many of you beautiful bastards know, I've been rocking my movement gear for years now with tons of super stylish watches, sunglasses, rings, and bracelets for men and women. What's not to love? And if you're looking for great everyday watches for both business and casual looks, you should definitely check out their new ultra sleek legacy slim watch collection. These watches are 42 millimeter with a polished brush case finish and a choice of stainless steel or leather bands. And if you're looking for a dressier feel, they have a compact 40 millimeter size that goes great with both suits and tees. And you know, movement products have a clean and minimal design because they're all about simple style and functionality, all at an affordable price. And with the holidays right around the corner, you cannot go wrong with gifting a loved one with movement. And best of all, right now, movement is offering you beautiful bastards 15% off plus free shipping. All you gotta do is head over to movement.com slash DeFranco or just click my link down below. Just touch it, see what happens. I'm giving you permission. And the first bit of awesome today is we are seeing records being broken in the entertainment space. First up, you have Blackpink, who on Sunday became the first K-pop group to surpass 50 million subscribers on YouTube, also making them the second most subscribed music artist on YouTube, just behind Justin Bieber. That news also just coming a day after the band's latest album. It made it to the number one spot on iTunes' top album charts in at least 57 different international regions. On top of that, their music video for their song, Love Sick Girls, just set a new YouTube record by becoming the fastest music video by a South Korean girl group to reach 10 million views. Right, getting that in just 53 minutes? Because apparently that was not already enough. We also, in the past 24 hours, got a trailer for their new documentary, Light Up the Sky. We got the Honest trailer for The Kissing Booth. We had Haley Steinfeld on Stir Crazy. We got When Time Became History, The Human Era. Binging with Babish gave us some garlic bread goodness. And if you want to see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, really anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. And then let's talk about the Supreme Court in the news. You know, with the passing away of RBG, the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett, there has been a lot of talk about the Supreme Court and what might happen to, you know, the ACA, your healthcare, what's gonna happen with Roe v. Wade, reproductive rights. But I mean, in addition to that, there is so much more at play. I mean, yesterday was the first day of the court's new term and already there are two really big stories that are coming out of it. First up actually deals with this election, what votes will or won't be counted, and it's specifically aimed at South Carolina. So what we saw was the Supreme Court siding with Republicans, thus reinstating a mandate that requires voters to get a witness signature on their absentee ballots. And that was opposed by Democrats who thought that during a pandemic, requiring someone to get a witness signature would be difficult and limiting for voters. And in fact, prior to the Supreme Court decision, lower courts agreed with Democrats and they actually suspended the rule because of COVID-19, saying that it would interfere with a person's right to vote. But like we said, ultimately the Supreme Court decided that that rule should be reinstated with there being no noted dissents. And with this decision, you had Justice Brett Kavanaugh writing, this court has repeatedly emphasized that federal courts ordinarily should not alter state election rules in the period close to an election. Also adding that state election rules regarding the pandemic should not be subject to second guessing by an unelected federal judiciary, which lacks the background, competence and expertise to assess public health and is not accountable to the people. Now, notably as yes, it pertains to the story, but also if you are a South Carolina voter, the Supreme Court did make an exception saying that ballots that have already been cast or that are received within the next two days do not need a witness. Though it is worth noting here that justices Clarence Thomas, Samuel Alito and Neil Gorsuch would have ordered that any ballot, regardless of when it had been sent, should not be counted if it did not have a witness signature. Yeah, this is an incredibly important story to note because as I hope you are well aware, we are actively in an election already. We, we say election day, but voting is already actively happening. In fact, according to the Associated Press, in South Carolina, more than 200,000 absentee ballots have been mailed out already and 18,000 have already been returned in. So if you are a South Carolina voter who has not already mailed back, know that you now need to do this or your vote will not count. And as far as the responses to this news, the GOP chairwoman Ronna McDaniel saying, the Supreme Court just handed Republicans and the voters of South Carolina a huge victory for election integrity. You also had chairman of the South Carolina Republican Party, Drew McKissick, releasing a statement saying, despite the Democrats' efforts to hijack a pandemic and use it to meddle with our election laws, they've lost. We're pleased the Supreme Court reinstated the witness signature requirement and recognized its importance in helping to prevent election fraud. But on the other hand, you had some seeing this decision as voter suppression with a different name, saying that not everyone may know that the rule is being reinstated and some may continue to vote without it, with some saying things like the Supreme Court just handed the South Carolina election to Trump and Lindsey Graham, or at least made it a hell of a lot harder for Biden and Jamie Harrison to have all their votes counted. People will continue to mail 
violent ballots not knowing this. You also had the African American Policy Forum saying, Republicans are waging a war on voting rights. In every state, they're fighting to make it harder to vote and easier to throw out ballots. John Roberts and the other conservatives on the Supreme Court will work overtime to help them succeed in their goal of suppressing votes. Today's SCOTUS order concerning South Carolina's absentee ballot witness requirement is one such example. Sadly, there will be many more such decisions between now and November. Also, with the situation you have people like Rick Hasten, an election law expert at the University of California, Irvine writing, this sends a strong signal that the Supreme Court is going to be wary of federal court order changes close to the election, even those done to deal with burdens on voters created by the pandemic. This is a signal that this continues to be a court not willing to strongly protect voting rights. And stories like this are why I will continue to echo the point of if you are someone that wants the Lindsey Grahams and Trumps of the world out of office, do not get complacent and cocky when you see the state and the national poll. None of that matters if you're not staying informed, staying focused, getting the word out when news like this is happening, and you're voting like this may be the last time you ever get the chance to vote. You better be bringing that kind of energy because who knows how many ballots are gonna try to get rejected. But yeah, that's where I'll leave that story for now. But then the next big Supreme Court story is one that actually starts with Kim Davis. That is probably a name that you're familiar with, though have not thought of in a long time. She was that Kentucky clerk who years ago made headlines for refusing to issue marriage licenses to same-sex couples, saying she wouldn't do this because it conflicted with her religious beliefs. And yesterday, what we saw was the court saying they would not hear an appeal in her case. But even though the Supreme Court is not taking up that case, questions about a potential threat to Obergefell v. Hodges, the decision that allows for same-sex marriage, still came up. Because Justice Thomas, joined by Justice Alito, wrote an opinion about that decision and Kim Davis. With that opinion, saying that the decision could, quote, threaten the religious liberty of the many Americans who believe that marriage is a sacred institution between one man and one woman, and that Obergefell v. Hodges enables courts and governments to brand religious adherents who believe that marriage is between one man and one woman as bigots, making their religious liberty concerns that much easier to dismiss. While Thomas said that he does agree with the decision to not take up Davis's appeal because it did not cleanly present the issues with the decision, he still spoke in defense of her situation, writing, Davis may have been one of the first victims of the court's cavalier treatment of religion in its Obergefell decision, but she will not be the last. Due to Obergefell, those with sincerely held religious beliefs concerning marriage will find it increasingly difficult to participate in society without running afoul of Obergefell and its effect on other anti-discrimination laws. And from all of that, we saw a lot of outrage. With people like Chastin, Buttigieg saying, just a reminder that overturning Obergefell, gay marriage, is in the Republican Party's official platform. Alito and Thomas just signaled their wishes to overturn it, and we already know where Barrett stands on the issue. Please vote. Though, regarding Amy Coney Barrett, it is worth noting that she has expressed her personal disagreement with gay marriage, but has written very little about it in a legal sense and has not specifically said she would overturn it. Senator Ed Markey also saying, five years ago, the Supreme Court legalized same-sex marriage in all 50 states. It is the settled law of the land. The Senate must reject any nominee who would side with Justices Thomas and Alito to overturn Obergefell. But ultimately, that is where we are with the story. As far as would this actually get overturned, I mean, we'd have to wait and see, but even the prospect, I understand that this change only happened about five years ago. I mean, it's genuinely alarming out of, out of all the things that I was like, oh, that, that's something that they might take away or change. I didn't think that. But it also doesn't appear that it's something that the American people want. According to a Gallup poll this year, two out of every three Americans supports gay marriage. While the support for that is obviously much higher with Democrats and independents, I mean, Republicans are almost at 50%, which I mean, is a big change. It's almost double than like 10 years ago. But yeah, that is where the Supreme Court stories and actually the show today will end. I, of course, give you the story, some of my personal takeaway and then of course I pass the question off to you what are your thoughts on either of these? Yeah, I'd really love to know your thoughts on this. And that is where I'm going to end today's show. As always, thank you for being a part of these daily dives into the news. If you're new here, join the family, hit that subscribe button, maybe even text me at 813-213-4423. You get notifications for the big stuff, some behind the scenes, other cool stuff. Also, remember you only have six days left if you wanna grab something at shopdefranco.com. But with that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco, you've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.